Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. And I'm Mike Heffernan. Dr. Heffernan is a cardiologist. Big, big part of the channel. Everybody's loving the cardiology series because it <laughs> teaches so much to the everyday person that commonly has heart problems, unfortunately, in our world. Matters of the heart. Matters of the heart. And today we're talking about when the heart fails. Not Dr. Zalzal's high school experiences. We've been through that. We've been through that so many times. Watch another video. <laughs> Watch another video. But today we're talking about heart failure or sometimes referred to as congestive heart failure. So what, what is heart failure? Um, so there are two types of heart failure. Okay. I think that's probably the best place to start. Um, so half the people who have heart failure have had a large heart attack before, for instance, or uh, um, have essentially what is a reduced ejection fraction. Okay. So, uh, so the pump doesn't work as well. And so if my heart beats really strong and squeezes all the blood out with every heartbeat, half the people who have heart failure have a heart that is really weak. And so the weakness may be from a viral infection, it may be from a large heart attack in the past, um, or a variety of other disorders. Okay. So that's heart failure number one. Heart failure number two, which was really kind of less recognized over the last, say, 10 or 20 years, is something called heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. So if we do an ultrasound of their heart called an echocardiogram, um, their heart function looks like it's perfectly normal in terms of how well it squeezes. It squeezes just as well as mine. The problem is it doesn't relax well. Oh. So it squeezes well, but doesn't relax it's stiff. well. It's stiff. And because it's stiff, the pressure will accumulate in there and will back up into the lungs okay. and make you feel short of breath. With the previous heart failure I described, where the heart is really big and baggy and not squeezing well, because it's not squeezing well, the pressure accumulates in there and the blood backs up in the lungs and makes you short of breath. So in the end, both people with heart failure, either a preserved or a reduced ejection fraction, both feel short of breath. Okay. But they do so for different reasons. Right. Yeah. Which one's more common? It's half and half. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. That's easy to remember. Yeah. So it's interesting that a heart problem actually presents often with long symptoms. So what would be the, the most common symptoms someone with heart failure would present to their family doctor with? Shortness of breath. Well, number one, shortness number of breath. Number one. Okay. Kind of. Is there a number two and three or it's just shortness of breath? Uh, yeah. So number two would be swelling in the legs. Okay. Um, and so you can get swelling in the legs for a whole bunch of reasons. Sure. Um, just to keep that in mind. Um, but shortness of breath, swelling in the legs, and some fatigue, yeah. um, unexplained weight gain. You know, all of a sudden you've gone up three, four, or five pounds, you're not eating anymore. Right. You're, you know, letting out your belt buckle one more loop. Um, and, but you had this constellation of symptoms that may be just simply too much water, okay. essentially in your body, and uh, as a result of heart failure. Yeah. I remember in medical school, they talked about people that lied down flat. Sometimes they felt uncomfortable when they're sleeping, yep. so they'd either raise the head of the bed or they'd have more pills, or sometimes they'd have to sit up at the side of the bed because they're short of breath. Exactly, and so we asked that as a routine with patients. Okay. You know, how, it, it, patients ask, oh, why are you asking how many pillows they sleep with <laughs> right. at night? Right. But that's relevant for us, yes. and so, if you sleep with one or two pillows for comfort, no problem. Right. But if you're starting to sleep up in a lazy boy chair, right. um, because, you, because you feel short of breath because you feel you short flat. of breath, um, yeah. then that's a problem. Or if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're gasping for air, you feel like you need to open up a window yeah. uh, and sit on the side of the bed, um, then, then, that's, uh, then that may be congestive heart failure. Okay. And of course, when I ask that question, it's like, Oh, doc, I get up in the night lots of times. To like, pee. I know, I know you do, but it's not, it's not about that. I'm more interested if you're getting up for shortness of breath. Sure. Okay, yeah. so this is not a symptom that you want to sort of sit on and say, I'll check this out next week. If you're feeling any of these symptoms, just get to your primary care physician yep. or your healthcare provider and get it checked out. That's that shortness of breath, worse when you lie flat, uh, or if you find in the middle of the night, you've got a few pillows to help you breathe better or you're sitting at the edge of the bed, okay? So check that out. Don't sit on this symptom. Perfect. So you go to your doctor's office and what does your doctor do or your cardiologist for that matter? Like what, what kind of, if as far as examinations and testing, what would they do to diagnose it? Yeah. So uh, routine physical exam. Okay. So the clinical exam is really going to make it. Yeah. Um, that's kind of one of the beauties of, of what drew me into cardiology, you know, with, with your eyes, with just listening and doing, taking a good history with the stethoscope, yep. you can make a pretty good diagnosis with some very simple tools but then we'll confirm it. Um, we'll do an ECG okay. and we'll look to see, are you in a normal rhythm or maybe not a normal rhythm? And we just talked about atrial fibrillation not long ago as one potential cause of something that can put somebody into congestive heart failure, that being an abnormal heart rhythm. 
Um, and then the next really important thing is the echocardiogram. Okay. So the echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart. It's gonna immediately tell me, okay, is this heart too stiff or is this heart really weak? Okay. Are there other problems going on in the heart? You know, maybe is there a valve problem? Is there a really leaky valve? Or is there a really narrow valve? Which are things that can cause heart failure. Right. Um, and then in some regions, there may be a blood test available called, it's strange, the brain naturetic peptide, the BNP. Mm -hmm. yeah, and B thinking, oh my gosh, you're doing a brain blood test for a heart problem. Yep. It's just, it's just a product of, you know, it's an original yes. discovery. Yes. Yeah. So we do a BNP and that's a great biochemical test. Just a simple blood test can be done, come back, comes back in hours. And if it's really elevated, we know the patient's in heart failure. Okay. And the ultrasound's an easy test. I mean, don't, yeah. don't be afraid of that one. And it's harmless because there's no radiation. It's painless because it's just a probe yep. sort of over your heart. You're not, and you don't, if you're claustrophobic, you don't have to worry about it because you're not going into a machine like an MRI or anything like that. Ultrasound's a super easy test to have done on your heart. So don't freak out if that gets uh, It's prescribed. called an echo. What's that? It's called echo. A, yeah, echo. Echo. Yeah, yeah, echo. Echocardiogram. So ultrasound waves bouncing off the heart, create an image of the heart. They can actually use some Doppler and figure out how the heart's moving. It's actually like an that. amazing yeah. test. Yeah. It's, it's, for a non-invasive test, it's a pretty amazing it's, test. It's a pretty incredible test. The, yeah. the fidelity and the detail that we get Especially now, nowadays. Oh, you know, 20 years ago when we, I was looking at echos, it always looked like it was through a snowstorm. Yeah. Um, but now it's incredible. And their the colors. Picture. Yeah. Okay, so you've had the symptoms this uh, shortness of breath, the hallmark symptoms, you might have some swelling of your ankles. And you'll see too, as, as surgeons, when we replace a knee or a hip on one side, and one side swollen, we're like, that's okay, that's cool, it's swollen because right. you just had surgery. However, if we see both sides are swollen, like, okay, you gotta get that checked out because yeah. that might be a sign of heart failure. So shortness of breath, you've got the swelling of the ankles, which is just fluid pooling up in your body. It's the same thing, you feel like you're gaining weight, you need a bigger belt buckle. You go see your doctor, asks you about these symptoms, and listens to your heart, might even look at the veins in your neck, Yep. Try and figure out if you're backing up some fluid. Then we'll order an echocardiogram and a BMP. And BMP. Okay, so then that leads us to treatment. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the echo guides the treat because right. the echo is going to say, okay, if you're somebody with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction, okay. if your heart is kind of big and baggy and the pump is not working as well as it should, there are a whole series of medications that have been established over the years. And in fact, we're in a pretty exciting area in the treatment of heart failure uh, right now um, because there are a whole bunch of therapies that have come online in the last five or six years that are really having a dramatic effect. So right now, we're in 2022. Yes. Um, this is gonna change as time goes on and people might be watching this five years from now. Okay. So in 20, unlikely. Unlikely. <laughs> but in 2022, there are four pillars of therapy okay. for this kind of condition. So there's a beta blocker, okay. um, and then there's something called a, um, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. So that's, that's a, you know, a mouthful, an MRA. Okay. Um, people are looking up medications that might be spironolactone or a plerinone. Okay. Um, and then the next class is, uh, there's only one in this group right now, and that's called Secubitril Valsartan. There might be others that come. That's our, our go-to in, in kind of that grouping. If people can't tolerate that medication for whatever reason, there are also something called ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So okay. angiotensin um, receptor blockers um, or ACE inhibitors. And then finally, the kind of the new kid on the block are medications that were originally developed for the treatment of diabetes. And they all the medications that are being developed now have to, diabetes medications in particular, don't have to, they have to prove that they just don't lower sure. the sugar. They also have to prove that they're safe. Sure. Um, and so all the companies are mandated to prove safety. And so they expect that when they do the safety test, that it's gonna be rather neutral. Yep, we're great for diabetes, we'll be neutral for everything else. Well, lo and behold, this class of medications get tested, great for diabetes and a surprising result in people with heart failure. Mm -hmm. And it actually was dramatically improved. And so now this has become, now we have dedicated heart failure clinical studies with this, and it is, it is the new kid on the block and, and has a significant benefit. So those are the four. Wh um, okay. Which one? Which? So those are called SGLT2 inhibitors. Okay. Um, and uh, so empagliflozin and dapagliflozin are yeah. two in particular that are wow. most commonly used in heart failure. Oh, is that what the last one's called? Get my heart a going? <laughs> Get my heart a going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and those are typically for type 2 diabetes. 
Oh, actually, and it's used even in patients with not no diabetes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So wow. we, so Amazing. this is a diabetes medication, but okay. we now use it in people without diabetes who have heart failure. And then it could be a combination of those four classes. We as well. try and use all four. All four, right? Wow. So all four, we try and use them at the the maximum dose. And in the cardiology community, there's a lot of hand wringing about which one do we start first right. and how high do we go. Sure. As a general rule, we start them all. Yeah. We try and start them all within the first few weeks or the first month at little doses, okay. and then just kind of increase them as tolerated. And we always say this whenever we're saying we're going to get into some sort of medical treatment or surgical treatment, lifestyle modification, trying to improve your health without medication is always the best way to go always uh, however if you're the type of person that really hates uh, big companies and hates medicines uh, it's not going to be easy for you if you have heart failure because this is an integral part of treatment for heart failure is some form of medication certainly we always advocate for the lifestyle modification always. Try, try and try and get your health in order uh, as much as you can but if you're in a state where you're having active heart failure you're going to have to embrace the use of some form of medication in this situation and I think the reason you can't solve it is because even though it's a muscle you can't really train it necessarily yeah. and if you have a valve problem you can't you can't make your valves better you can't make them less stiff or less less leaky or, or bigger right. you can't make the hole bigger so unfortunately without surgery or medication that's complicated for so sure. these these diseases of the heart are irreversible would you say would you say when it gets to that point no we're really lucky now you know with these therapies okay. you know years ago I would used to tell people in our heart function clinic Look, here's, here it is, um, patients with heart failure in your particular condition with the reduced ejection fraction, a third of patients will get better, a third of patients will stay the same, and a third are going to get worse um, with our best therapies. And at that time, we so only like had two. it's like flipping a coin. It was almost a three side <laughs> coin, but now it's much better than that. And just actually had that conversation with somebody not long ago. Yeah. I don't use the, the that third, third, a third story anymore because okay. we're seeing a lot more people who are improving and yep. stabilizing over time. Amazing. Uh, it is amazing. So the, the and so risk you can of, back off the medications eventually. No, I, and actually, well, to be perfectly honest, we didn't know the answer to that. Um, and so we kind of fibbed, I suppose, to patients for a long time and said, no, just stay on them. Right. Um, because we don't, we don't know. That was the best We don't know. Um, so there was a really good and important study that came out of England a couple of years ago where they said, look, we, we need to test this. And so they let half the patients come off the medications um, when their heart function improved and got back to normal. And the other half stayed on. And unfortunately for the half that came off, there was a significant number Okay. who had deterioration of their heart function again. Oh, and so now we know it's just best to just keep it on. Um, and they're not hard to take. Sure. Yeah. Do you, do you ever need surgery for heart failure? Uh, sometimes, okay. yeah. So if it's a valve problem, right. um, we can fix that. Yeah. Um, and that's a dramatic improvement okay. um, for sure. Um, sometimes you need surgery because if your heart function is so poor, um, as uh, with the ejection fraction is quite low, it increases your risk for sudden death. Okay. And so there's a fancy machine we can put in called the defibrillator, right. um, which just sits there and watches every heartbeat, every second. And if you happen to go into a rhythm that puts your life at risk, um, it does some tricks to try and get you out of that rhythm. And if after you know a few seconds it goes, ah, you know what? Bam. Yeah. And just shocks you back to a normal rhythm. Like the cardiac thumb, essentially, yeah. right? It's like yeah. a mechanical cardiac thumb. Okay, yeah. big, big surgery. I've had a few patients who've had heart transplants. Yeah. So we've got heart transplants, we've got xenografts too. Yeah, that's um, new. I think that was in the news recently. Yeah, so that's down. just a xenograft is just a graft from another species. Right. Uh, and mechanical uh, hearts. So the mechanical hearts are almost a non-option. Okay. You know, um, there's a, a device called an LVAD. So yes. when patients get, you know, really almost end of life, um, and uh, and and usually LVADs are prescribed or used certainly in Canada often as a bridge to a transplant. Right. Um, and then and then transplant, of course, is an option for patients. And I have several patients who have had heart transplants. Okay. Um, the problem is there are only about 200 transplants in Canada per year. Okay. So there are not a lot, right. um, unfortunately. Not a viable option. So them. it's an option for some individuals, yeah. but for, not for the majority. Sure. Um, but so it, it works okay? A car, yeah, heart transplants, it's not a cure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's its own problem. Because right. um, there are, you know, a lot of medications, issues about rejection. Sure. Th that's, a, that's a whole other yeah, YouTube sure, video. Sure, yeah. um, 
Yeah, yeah. And, and what we didn't talk about was heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction. Right. So this is the group that actually looks like things are fine, but the heart isn't relaxing well. Yep. We had no good therapies for that, um, unfortunately, right. other than just a water pill right. to try and relieve the congestion. Um, it looks like now there's at least one medication that will be moving forward okay. to try and help that. And it's in the early phases? Um, it, yeah, in the early phases of being approved. Yes. And it's likely that in 2022, this medication will be approved um, in the United States, Canada, and Europe. Okay. Um, and so that's good. That's our first thing that we can lean on. And there are others coming down the pipe. If you happen to fall into that 50% category, stay tuned because there are treatments that are coming down the, the, down the road. There you go. That's so exciting. Um, yeah, heart failure is certainly a very debilitating condition. And, and like they both said before, if you feel like you're having some of these symptoms, please talk to your doctor and get assessed to make sure that you have something that potentially is correctable and treatable so that you can have a better quality of life. And if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. Thanks again to Dr. Heffernan for joining us and teaching us all about cardiology. Thanks for having me, guys. We'll see you next time.